What's your best selling product today? Cheapest price and made in the USA. To be honest with you, I never thought I'd see the day that happened. Why do you think manufacturers push their accessories? $38 a roll delivered with your logo on the material and that's 10 square rolls. Nobody in the market's at that or even close. We have all of our prices, we have pictures. You have all these guys walking by looking at the prices like, that's fake, that's a scam. Does your price change from state to state? Like for example, Hawaii, California versus Minnesota. The week after IRE, we had five different major manufacturers show up at our office trying to figure out what we're doing. We don't have a $15 million warehouse stock in it and 47 office guys we got to pay for. We're going to keep doing what we do and they can't change it. My name is Kyle Van Boxel. I'm the founder of Van Boxel Building Supply and have a little bit of story about the way we got started. We started in 2018 little bit in the liquidation business. We got into the floor and the cabinet industry. One thing led to another, how we wound up in the roofing industry. Um, like everybody, we started off very small. By no means are we huge right now. Uh, in our niche business, we are doing pretty well. Um, we started out working in a barn, very minimal, very low overhead. We built our first warehouse going into 2019, still in more of the liquidation business, doing overstock discontinued. Once we got up to about 2020 is when we really started kind of hitting the roofing industry quite a bit. We started in the second industries with where roofing, second shingles, second ice and water, um, and started pushing that quite a bit. Took a while to get into, definitely a little bit hard to get into once we got the wheels moving. Describe a uh, second market in materials in the roofing industry. What it is, how big it is, who buys it, who sells it. Uh, well, the second market uh, in the roofing industry, the main players, you're going to have uh, shingles, ice and water, shield. That's going to be the majority of the second market. Um, we sell truckloads all over the country of it, and we sell to a lot of really big companies. A lot of uh, major roofers throughout the country buy it. The thing with the second market is it is not warranty product. The big thing with it, the manufacturer does not want their name on the product. It could be seconds for variations or reasons. It could be uh, rolls too long, too short. It could be a shingle colors, a hair off. I mean, a list goes on and on for seconds. There is a category where it goes to thirds, which theoretically those are supposed to be thrown away. We would never deal in those. Um, when it comes to the no warranty issue on it, uh, we technically will not tell you what brand it is. Um, no manufacturer will honor the warranties on them. That is why they are seconds. But a lot of our bigger roofers, what they do is they put their own warranty on it. They'll come through, say, just making up a name like ABC Roofing. They'll go put their own warranty on the product so it is warrantied because everybody knows how roofing warranties go. You put your own on it, you have it, um, and you're good to go. So vast majority of our big clients do that. Or even you get a lot of people with budget jobs. They want to go through um, a big company, has a lot of people on budget, fixed incomes. Unfortunately, I hate to say, but flip houses, a lot of those guys just trying to get in and out. There's not necessarily anything wrong with the product. It could be something cosmetically, and they do save a ton of money. In retrospect, the shingle market, you're gonna be buying shingles about 50% of MSRP on them. Ice and water shield, those prices are all over the board, but you're in the low 30s delivered on ice and water shield. So it is a huge market. We grew that market to about as big as we can. Right now, we buy all the seconds we can. We can't grow that anymore. There's no more seconds object for the manufacturer is to create a material and not have seconds. So once we started doing that, we got into the A-grade market. Um, we started manufacturing our own products, continuing to grow, continuing to go. Of course, we still do the seconds. We still buy all we can because we have a lot of buyers that love the seconds. They'll never buy anything else. That's their bread and butter. That's how they compete. Um, different markets, they're so tough. You need any competitive edge you have, and that's a lot of people's competitive edge. You just have to know what goes with seconds, which you know, there are no warranty. We try to be as straightforward with people on them. Um, it's a huge, huge market, especially in the shingle game. We're selling, uh, I mean, 30 trucks a month, roughly. There is a lot more shingle seconds out there available. That is still a much bigger market. To be honest with you, I couldn't tell you how big that market technically is. Can you touch on manufacturer warranties and the game? Is it a game they play or what do you know about manufacturer warranties? So as uh, pretty much all roofers know with the manufacturer warranties, it's more of just a uh, certificate they put through that to me, it doesn't really hold that much of a back. 
When you go back on it, how many people have went back on manufacturer warranties for roofing? Extremely, extremely few. Um, in retrospect, manufacturer warranties in the IRE show last year, I had a very interesting conversation with a rep, and what he came back to tell us was 1% of all roofs, somebody tries to file a manufacturer warranty on it. And of that 1%, 1% get approved. So you're looking, manufacturer warranty is next to none. They will go through and find one high nail, one thing you did wrong on a roof, and fail the whole roof. So warranty is only as good as a piece of paper it's wrote on for a lot of them. Not talking bad about every manufacturer. Some of them, you know, honestly will try to, but every nail has to be good. Um, their inspectors have to not find anything. And that's where it comes into the second where a lot of our installers put their own warranty on the product. A lot of major roofers do that on own. It, so the, why do you think manufacturers push their accessories? Like their underlayment, their ice and water. Is it a profit driven? or is it quality driven demand? That comes completely down to profit. You get to these large corporations, they don't care about you know, what you're using, you saving money, it's bottom of line. It's trying to get their quarterly profit up. What are we gonna do to get our quarterly profit? Well, let's mandate three out of five of these have to be our product in order to get our warranty, which doesn't mean a whole lot. The customers are gonna look at it, think it does, but at the end of the day, it really doesn't. Um, margins on roof material, I mean, it is obscene. What some people are marking up some major manufacturers are marking up for roofing. There is no way it should be going you know, three, four times quicker than inflation on roofing products. And at the end of the day, the guy doing the work, you know, sweating on the roof is the one paying more money. His margins are lower to appease the corporate guys in some office somewhere in air conditioning in the summer. What's your best selling product today? Best selling product, hands down, is our synthetic felt, our 100 GSM synthetic felt. A great product. We private label it for all different companies. We don't charge any extra to private label for you. We ship direct to you guys. So we manufacture and we ship direct. So a little bit different on um, it, but hands down, that is our best. We do have other products as well. Um, we do have uh, you know, A-grade ice and water. We're starting getting that rolling. We do have a nail program getting it rolling. Um, I think the synthetic is the best seller. The reason why is it's marketing too. It's not only roofing, but you could put your own name on it with our certifications we have a miami dade we're certified everywhere and it's just it's a great product and nobody's even close on price i mean we're as low as 38 dollars a roll delivered with your logo on the material and that's 10 square rolls nobody in the market's at that or even close we definitely get a lot of hate from other major manufacturers other companies over advertising so for example last year we were at ire the international Ref roof and expo um, first year there i mean we're doing what we do we put our prices up. We want the customers to see our prices. We want the customers to see our delivered prices. So we're sitting there with all the big guys behind our booth. We have all of our prices. We have pictures. You have all these guys walking by looking at the prices like, that's fake, that's a scam. And then of course we have customers we sold to will come up like, no, it's, it's true. The prices seem like they would be kind of scamish. A lot of the, uh, so after IRE, the week after IRE, we had five different major manufacturers show up at our office trying to figure out what we're doing. When we're in Northeast Ohio, nobody's in Northeast Ohio. These guys are flying in unannounced to see what we're doing and why we're doing it. So one of those that was uh, almost humbling that they did that, that we are known now. And that was last March in Dallas, Texas, when we went to that show, that was our first major show we did. And now all the manufacturers know our name, know we're gonna advertise. And at the end of the day, there's not a product close to price and quality of ours. So of course they're gonna hate us. I mean, really don't care. At the end, I want the roofer to make more money and have a better product and have a good product at the end of the day. Anyone sued you yet? So yeah, we do have one lawsuit against us. Of course, that's gonna happen in business. Um, that is for a trademark uh, infringement lawsuit. Of course, they're not telling us who's suing us. Some big corporate game. I'm sure we're gonna have more How lawsuits. How is it possible? I, I, I've never heard of anyone suing someone without knowing who's suing you. I have no idea. I contacted our attorney to get it going. They're supposed to release the name in November of who is filing a suit against us. Okay. It's going through the government legal process of trademark and all that fun stuff. So I don't know on- Are you worried I'm, about it? Not at all. Uh, trademark, I mean, there's only so much they can do. It's somebody trying to say, hey, we have more money than you. Don't mess with us. And I guess uh, when it comes to business, I'm arrogant enough to where I kind of enjoy that aspect. Let them waste their money and do that. At the end of the day, it's not gonna do anything to us other than give me a little bit of enjoyment of uh, aggravating somebody. I mean, if they want to, go right ahead. We're gonna keep doing what we do and they can't change it. 
extra publicity and the roofing inside is going to cover that lawsuit. I promise you that. Um, what product made you the most money up to date? Um, up to date, uh, the product that made us the most money uh, has been our synthetic felt. It's not so much because margins are different. Our margins per roll are actually less than the other. It's due to the sheer quantity we move of synthetic felt. Um, we are moving, I mean, tens of thousands of rolls of synthetic felt. So that's why that has been the best profitable. You know, margin wise, we don't keep huge margins on a lot of products. It's why we uh, move what we do. But yeah, the synthetic felt has by far been our best product. And that's something I look forward to growing in the future. Love it. Let's talk about manufacturing in the United States versus overseas. Uh, what do you see is happening in the landscaping like of manufacturing? Do you see the trend that people are building manufacturers in the United States or it's all moving to China and other areas? Did, so, did Trump help with the situation? So manufacturing in the United States compared to overseas Asia, is definitely it is rough. I learned a lot about it last year. I went over to India for a few weeks, went toward factories, got it set up. Um, that is by far one of the biggest hindrances of shipping coming in. United States, ideally, I'd love to get everything manufactured in the United States or Canada, at least keep it as local as possible. But realistically, you just can't. Um, for example, synthetic felt, that is a highly labor intensive uh, manufacturing process. Um, when I was in India to get one roll of synthetic felt from start to finish, there's about 20 different people that are involved in getting that mm -hmm. together. US Canadian labor, US Canadian restrictions, it is unfortunately, I hate to say it, but it's almost impossible. There's really no domestic uh, manufacturers of it. And then for manufacturing coming back to the United States, it gets very political. You know, we go four years where a lot of them will come back, then there's election and three companies will magically go out of business overnight just because they're aggravated by it. My end goal is to eventually be able to uh, manufacture as much as we can in the United States. I do think it's very feasible to manufacture nails in the United States. When it comes to synthetic felt, you know, underlayments, ice and water shield is very feasible in the United States. Um, what this, about flooring cabinets, other items? So we do sell a lot of flooring and cabinets. Those are starting to get manufactured in the United States as well. We're out of Northeast Ohio, our main hub. There is a lot of cabinet manufacturers local. Um, so we're getting vast majority of our kitchen cabinets are manufactured in the United States uh, for the first time ever. So we've been in the flooring industry as well for about five, since 2018. Always, you get the you know, a decent quality, affordable flooring is coming from China, Vietnam, one of those countries. As of two weeks ago, we ended up doing a major purchase from Georgia. Now we have the highest quality flooring, cheapest price, and made in the USA. To be honest with you, I never thought I'd see the day that happens. It's, uh, it's nice. I mean, so the company got going. They did have a rough start. The factory, when it started, like any factory is going to have, nothing against them. Now they're pumping out a great product at an amazing price. If a few more companies like that jump up in the United States, China is not going to be able to compete in the flooring industry. So, I mean, they're looking 30, 40% cheaper built in the United States. So that's something I look forward to in uh, the flooring industry. Love it. Um, how can homeowner potentially do their research about quality versus price? How do they know if contractor using cheap materials versus expensive and how does it color rate with a price like for example on flooring if someone bids on a job way cheaper how can a homeowner do that research where's the materials coming from the same for the shingles how do you spot the second market oh how do you spot the second market on products it can be a little bit tough on times uh, the law is when you buy a second product, the receipt has to say seconds, builder grade, off specs, something of that. There are a few companies local that try to sell seconds flooring, which I mean, we don't sell seconds flooring, but there are companies that try to, and they don't mark anything on the receipt. Um, can you report them? You definitely, you, fight it? you definitely can report companies for not marking that they are selling seconds, but like any legal process, it's going to be long drawn up. Nobody really knows who you're going to report to. Um, there are a few other ways as well. For example, with flooring, the boxes normally are going to have a yellow mark on it. They're going to say off spec seconds. When you get to the roofing industry, it is definitely a little bit harder. In order to spot seconds, for example, seconds ice and water, there's no markings. There's nothing at all. The initial pallet might be marked, but a lot of people that sell it, they'll take it out of that and put it in, act like it's unboxed A-grade. 
Well, if you're buying ice and water that's unboxed, 99% of the time it's in the second market. Nobody's selling ice and water unboxed. That's the easy one. For the shingle market, the easy way to tell if it's seconds is if it's a, uh, in a white wrapper with some basic label on it. For example, ours just says roof and shingles. We keep it very basic. A couple other manufacturers will put brand names on it. Um, and it's almost always white wrappers. They're gonna say no warranty somewhere on it. If it says that, it's gonna be seconds. Also, if there's some big paragraph printed on it about how so-and-so manufacturer saves so many trees because they're recycling their shingles, you're buying seconds. <laughs> so. Great advice. Can you name a few mistakes you made the first couple of years in business? Well, I've made more than a few mistakes starting off in the first few years. Some of the biggest mistakes I made starting off was not doing my due diligence, kind of trusting people, trusting manufacturers and what I was buying. When I first started off, we only did seconds. So that was a rough market to begin with. We no longer do it. So for example, I would order a semi load of material. I wouldn't do all my due diligence on the product, get pictures. And they would send me something that should have been thirds, something that shouldn't have uh, even been available. We did have one truckload we bought. It was ice and water. I was supposed to get a whole truckload of ice and water. And I got a whole truckload of Mickey, or Mickey and Minnie Mouse pink computer chairs. And I couldn't do anything with them. They wouldn't return them, wouldn't do anything. Everything seconds off spec. When you buy direct from the mill is bought as is. With the Mickey and Minnie Mouse chairs, I still don't know where they came from. Somebody's missing a truckload of those and we got them. But there's been a lot of mistakes I've made. Um, that has by far been the biggest. And then organization. I have struggled with organization. I still struggle with organization. At least now I have a team that could kind of come behind me and clean up the mess I create. So that's been another aspect I've, uh, I've definitely struggled with as we grow. Uh, first few years, it wasn't as bad. You know, as I get bigger, there's just so much going on, so many different levels of the business, just allocating right positions to right people. Luckily at Van Boxel, we have a very diverse crew. Nobody is like anybody else. Everybody has their own niche they work in. So we're able to allocate different positions to different people. I let them kind of take off with what they have. And uh, I'm still working on organization. Someday I'll get it down. How much capital does it require to do what you did to start a supply house? Like what other steps do you have to have a lot of money? Do you have to have relationships? How does someone open a supply house these days? So starting off, there's definitely a lot of capital and time involved in starting a supply house. I started as bare bones as we possibly can. We still run very bare bones without a lot of overhead, without a lot of debt. But uh, we built our first building. We tried to do everything cash as is. I mean, our first warehouse was under $60,000, the first actual warehouse. Uh, we started literally in an old dairy barn and used the bottom of it, uh, you know, try to minimize. So doing the initial startup, of actual liquid capital, you would need maybe 20,000 just to get going, but it doesn't go quick. Our first year I did under $200,000 in total sales. And I don't think we broke a profit that year. I'm almost positive we did not. And you know, we've definitely grown from there. First few years were very, very rough. The, uh, then creating contacts is another major thing. I never knew how hard it was to create contacts, get to meet people. Like anything, a lot of it is who you know, not always what you know. So you have to know where to go and they don't make it easy. They don't make it easy on purpose because the big guys don't want competition. Once you start figuring out where to go, who to go, and where you're at, it definitely helps you out a lot. What about offering credit line to buyers? Do you offer it now or is it all cash sales? So right now we always try to do cash. It's easier. We don't have the credit card fees. We don't have that. Most of our roofing customers wire over do direct wires for us. We just started this year, we partnered with a financing company where contractors can go, they get six month terms, zero interest. The good thing with us, we're able to uh, sell to people that weren't able to buy before. Good thing for the contractors, they have six months uh, terms on it. It could go longer than that after six months, they get interest on it. So it opens up a lot more. Uh, and then it does take a little bit of liability with us. We have tried to give customers credits before. Unfortunately, no matter what due diligence we do on that, 20% of them somehow default. I mean, we're not one of the giant guys. So when we take a hit, it's a hit for everybody. So is it pretty common for contractors not to pay their suppliers? It is extremely common for contractors not to pay their suppliers or magically go out of business one day. When they go out of business, there's no recourse on that. If they shut down completely, you have nobody to sue. That's why they do LLCs or corporations. You know, they keep it separate entities. It's 
a lot. As of right now, we are probably still out a quarter million dollars of contractors not paying us. And that's a lot. So we kind of got rid of the credits. Uh, we have a few very, very good customers. You know, if something happens, we'll help you out any way we can. But uh, partnering with this financing company, it's been a little bit of a game changer for a lot of people. They do all the due diligence, they give the credit, and essentially we don't have the liability of it um, that we did before. And some of these orders, we do get pretty big orders. They, they will hurt us if we don't get paid on them. How can you describe working with the roofers and contractors? How different is it now versus what you thought it was gonna be when you started it? So working with roofers and contractors, to me, is actually easier than I thought it would be. Uh, I roofed myself by trade. I was an iron worker, so I've been in the building trades, you know, in hard physical labor building trades. Um, to me, I'm used to dealing. I mean, roofers are my people. I, you don't have to be so gentle with them. You could tell them how it is. You know, one of those, you get into an argument here or there, but the next day you come back and you're best friends. And that's what I like. What I don't like is the big corporate aspect where everything tries to be perfect no matter what it is. I would rather if there's an issue, tell me. We'll make it right with you, vice versa. Um, they've been surprisingly, I'm probably one of the few to say it, I prefer dealing with the roofers, contractors, um, people that are in the field and work with it because everything we sell, we worked with too. So I think that aspect of it is surprisingly great. Um, we actually have a couple different salesmen uh, deal in our wholesale. We have one salesman uh, who used to be uh, you know, in the food service industry and was able to deal with so those guys would come in after work. And I didn't know how great of a salesman they would be. And when they came in, they knew the lingo, they knew how to talk to people, knew what to do, and a great salesperson because of it. Um, but this, to be honest with you, Riffin and, con and you know, the contractors are easy to deal with 99% of the time. How are you different from your competition? You have smaller mom and pop shops like yourself, another supply house, you have big companies like ABC and SRS and Beacon. How are you different and how are you trying to be different from them? How do you position yourself in the market? So we are vastly different than a lot of the big guys out there, the big supply houses. I don't wanna be like them. I don't ever wanna be like them. What we do a little bit differently is we manufacture the product and we sell to you directly. We do have stakes in factories where we manufacture the product. We get it in, we sell to you. We don't have a $15 million warehouse stock in it and 47 office guys we gotta pay for. We keep our mar margins low, but what we wanna do is we wanna flood the market with our product and get it out there. We are different as in we sell to the end user directly. We'll sell pallet quantities, we sell truckload quantities. Even if you're close to one of our stores, we'll sell single rolls if need be. So that is definitely how we are different than them. We uh, always try to create a good product. We could even make, I mean, one of those, we could make a cheaper synthetic, but we won't put our name on something that's not a good quality. Our best one is the 100 GSM. Um, ice and water shield is, we have a 60 mil, very nice ice and water shield. And we try to be affordable. I won't sell anything we wouldn't use ourselves, And that goes across all aspects of the business. That's a big thing in the roofing industry right now. You have a few different levels of roofers. You have the roofers that want to sell the premium, the platinum, the very nice, top of the line, everything. You know, 95% of the roofers are in the middle. They want a good product, easy to walk on, safe for their guys to go up and down. And then you have the bottom 5 to 10% that don't care what they use. It's all about price at the end of the day. We're going to match their price point at the bottom. We won't match their their terrible quality. We're looking to service the guys in the middle that just want a great product. You know, for example, if somebody wants a 160 GSM synthetic felt, we'll make it for them. That's no issue at all. That is not our bread and butter though. It's the everyday use of a product, something that's going to last you 50 years without issues. So as where the box stores, they're the, uh, the big guys, not so much box stores, the real big guys, they'll sell anything. Half your salesmen never been on a roof. The guys in the corporate office never have. They're looking at margins, they're looking at quarterly profits, they're, that's all they're looking at. There's a lot more to it. I mean, roofing's one of those, it's literally somebody's life when they get on a roof. Is somebody a slip, fall? I mean, some of these felts are so incredibly bad and slippery and we won't put our name on it. Want something you could use? And at the end of the day, want to end roofer to save money and to be safe. Love it. Where do you see uh, supply, building supply industry is going? We see a lot of consolidations, we see lots of price increases, where is it all going? What's the biggest trend right now? So for building supply houses, I definitely see the price increases to keep going up. They're all together, regardless of what anybody says, they all magically have price increases the same day. Um, they're gonna keep going together. The big guys are gonna keep trying to buy out the, ball, the small guys, which they do. Um, I talk to companies all the time. 
realistically, there's only two or three of them I know whose end game is not selling to one of the big guys. We're not. And there's one other one I know that's not going to sell. We do position ourselves differently than pretty much anybody else in the market the way that we do business. So uh, we have not been approached by them. When we do, we're not going to sell. If we do get approached by them, we're not going to sell. But how do you compete with someone who can put you out of business like that? One of those, uh, trying to compete with these giant companies, everybody asks, says, hey, they can put you out of business. They can do A, B, and C. How are they going to put me out of business? I don't have debt. All of our buildings are paid for. Everything we have is paid for. As long as we make payroll and with our business differently, they could come after the roofing. You see where we're at now. It's a flooring and cabinet store. We have that too. That could cover overhead. We have, bar we have multiple businesses in there. So there's going to be a fight with this going forward. Guaranteed. I mean, we've already had the one lawsuit. There's going to be a fight. I mean, be honest with you. I'm, we're ready for it. There's only so much they can possibly do. They can, they're not going to take our business. I know what their margins are and they're not going down. Then people bring up a lot of the race to the bottom and we're priced on the bottom. Quality is not. They should theoretically be far cheaper than what we are. And they're not. I mean, I know what they're paying to manufacture products and it is obscene, the profit margins right now. So I don't foresee that as being much of an issue. Speaking of price increases, in your opinion, you know the back end of it now. What is the biggest driver? Is it a supply and demand? Is it greed or is it shortages? Why prices keep going up? Uh, the biggest demand that I see for price incre increases is corporate greed. They never want a quarter to be less than the laughs. They're doing corporate greed and then everybody implemented lean inventory. So they're trying not to keep a lot of inventory on hand. They're trying to push it to the suppliers, don't keep a lot, buy it as needed. But what that does is it keeps the quarterly profits on the major manufacturers going up. They could do instant price increases. And I believe lean inventory is terrible. We will never run it. I want, you know, 100,000 rolls of synthetic sitting in stock ready to go. I don't care if the prices go up. We already have it. It's paid for. You guys will get the same. Um, the corporates uh, are always worried about quarterly profits. We're, I'm the single owner of Anbox, so I could care less about quarterly profits. I care about you at the end of the year, see where we're at, average everything together. I do have a uh, business degree as well, do have multiple businesses. I do think differently when it comes to business. It's not about the short term, it's about the long term. Unfortunately, all these guys making a ton of money, they're trying to make each quarter better than the last. My thinking is in order to grow the business with lean inventory, technically you can keep each one going, but why wouldn't I do a huge purchase in the second quarter which will make my second and third quarter better and I get a better, better buy point in the second quarter. Kind of where we're at with it. So I definitely do think a little bit different, but it works for us. It goes against everything I learned in business, but to me it makes sense and it works, whether I'm right or wrong. Um, but yeah, corporate greed is definitely what is raising the prices. There's no other reason for it. Material price, raw goods went up a little bit, but it didn't go in up proportionally. Like shingle prices right now are out of hand. They blame fuel prices. Fuel's the same as it was, you know, a year ago or you know, five, six years ago it was high. And it just doesn't make sense. It comes up with anything they can to uh, justify price getting raised. What about the future as far as online versus brick and mortar stores? Do you see um, the rise of online sales? We see a roof store and a few other players that sell online. Do you see um, Amazon style uh, marketplace in the roofing industry? Or do you think it's always going to be a brick and mortar? Going forward, I definitely do see a rise of online sales in the roofing industry. Uh, for example, we saw off our website, we do some on Amazon. The online is a little bit harder to break into. People physically have to see your product, have to get it going from there. I do think there's going to be a definite rise. But the one thing, I think there will always be a need of brick and mortar stores, especially for the local roofers to go up, touch and feel the new products. Um, you still have to make your orders from a local supply house to get them shipped. Those brick and mortar, there's really no way to get rid of those aspects. But if, uh, for example, you're buying synthetic felt, you need a few pallets, that online is a perfect example of it. Um, nails are a little bit heavy to ship, so you lose uh, a little bit of your savings in nails. But uh, for the compact, more materials, ridge vent, that stuff definitely online is, I think, is going to be pushing a lot more, more logistics to it. But there's definitely a lot more savings. But right now, I mean, we've done a lot of research on it. I think it's about, don't quote me on the exact, like one half of a percent of uh, roof and underlayment is bought online. So it's very, very, very minimal. Sure. But I do see it going to that a little bit more, but I don't see it ever hitting 15, 
What other challenges do you see with the importing goods versus manufacturing here besides the labor issues, stuff like that? What else is going on? Why we cannot bring more products in? So major issues with importing goods, especially roofing goods right now, is the world is crazy. You never know what's going on in the world. Uh, for example, when we were first starting, I would send over you know, $50,000, $75,000 overseas, and I had no guarantee we would get product until we started doing factory visits, setting up our own. That is major. And if a container is coming over, it doesn't show up at our location even still, there's no recourse. There's a couple international uh, courts in Europe you're supposed to be able to go to, but very cost prohibitive. Even to get a case there costs a quarter million dollars. Nobody does it. Um, so it is rough. May, ideally, if you're able to produce domestically, you know, US, Canada, um, even Northern Mexico, one of those, you're remotely close. So there's so much easier. Uh, the logistics of it would be better, but the cost of labor is the biggest thing in uh, being able to do it here. I would love to produce everything in US and unfortunately we just can't yet. Metal versus asphalt shingle market. Um, funny enough that here in your area, you have metal dominance on roofing and it looks like it's cheaper too. How do you explain it and where do you see the future of roofing materials as far as shingles, metal, cedar, where are we going there? Oh, as for the future of roofing material, 10 years ago in our area, again, we're in Northern Ohio, there was no metal, very, very few. Some country houses would do it. As of right now, it's almost one third of all houses coming up are metal. Uh, reason why up here, it is cheaper to do metal roof than it is for shingles. They go right up. We have a couple major metal manufacturers up here where you're produced to, they ship it right out to you. You don't have the hindrance of it. Now metal has a much better coating than it used to have. They're warrantying metal roofs for 50 years. Realistically, if you paint it, you're good. For example, the building we're in right now, the roof put up there was 1960 and it's metal roof, it's still fine. So I do see a lot of the industry going towards metal, they breaking away, not gonna kill shingles. Some people still love the shingle look, but each year you look around, there's some new hybrid shingle, something else out there. At the end of the day, I think it's gonna come down to price which one throughout the United States is gonna be cheaper. And uh, I do see metal going that way a lot more as long as nothing crazy happens. I do see metal taking a bigger chunk of the market in uh, you know, most areas. Uh, let's talk about uh, rebates, gimmicks, and game that suppliers, manufacturers are doing. Do you do any rebates on your products? So when it comes to rebates, gimmicks, and all that stuff, I hate doing rebates. I like giving you the best price right off the bat. We had one company where they absolutely had to have a rebate. They wanted $2 a roll rebate. So what we did is we raised our price $2 a roll. I said, buy X amount in six months, you'll get your $2 a roll. And he was happy as could be. Why that mentality exists, do you think? People just want to feel like they're getting a deal. We're going to have people coming in, some of these bigger guys, like, oh, I do X amount of roofs a year. You need to give me a discount. You need to do this and that. I don't do it that way. I give you the best price. That's why nobody can touch our price and quality. Um, I mean, we did get the sale for the guy that wanted the rebate of $2 a roll. It's a hassle for everybody doing rebates. I have to pay somebody else to keep track of the rebates. Why wouldn't I just give you a better price right off the start and not do that? That is a, that is a huge hurdle is the rebates and incentives and gimmicks and uh, all that stuff. I try to stay away from that as much as possible. But unfortunately, every now and again, you get a customer that demands his rebate. So we raise the price of a roll to wow. accommodate. Does your price change from state to state, like for example, Hawaii, California versus Minnesota? So as weird as it is, a, uh, we were just at the Western Riffin Show and that's you know, California, all the Western United States. We had a group of roofers from Hawaii come over. They saw our price advertised as a synthetic felt as low as 38 a roll custom printed. And they started laughing like, ah, we're from Hawaii. How much is that gonna be? Like 38 a roll. And they're like, no, no, really, we're from Hawaii. How much? After about the sixth time, he realized we can ship to Hawaii for 38 a roll custom printed. Um, not saying every state's going to be exactly the same. Alaska, you might be 39 a roll just because boats don't go to Alaska that often. Sure. Um, but we try to keep it very, very uh, similar pricing throughout the United States. When you're talking synthetic felt, we might fluctuate $2 a roll throughout the whole United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. And for example, Hawaii, we just did our first sale to Hawaii. We sell continental United States, pretty much every state we've sold to. We've never done Hawaii, but simple to ship to. It's everybody's afraid of the unknown and it was unknown to us and it's cheaper to ship to Hawaii, to be honest with you. Really? <laughs> yes. So there's just a lot of unknowns with it. Um, 
For the prices, we definitely try to keep very, very similar. We do have uh, shipping points throughout the United States for pallet quantities, so we're able to keep our shipping caught down. But the way we advertise, the end, the price you see is delivered. We don't sh throw on the shipping cost and everything else on the end. When we're advertising a price, that's delivered to you. So that's the other thing which might be hurting us in the business model. I'm sure I know it is, but if I'm looking for a product, I don't want to sit there for 20 minutes trying to figure out shipping and everything else. How do you answer your critics who say that it's a race to the bottom? We do have a lot of critics saying it's a race to the bottom. We keep hearing it. Actually, more and more of these big shows we go to, we'll have some of the big guys come over just look, oh man, race to the bottom and price, race to the bottom. There's no race to the bottom. Uh, Quality-wise, yes, some of the big manufacturers are doing quality to the bottom. But with us, we won't sell that terrible quality. We have a good, a very good middle-of-the-road product that is our bread and butter. And our prices might be there, but we're where we need to be margin. I could always jack the price up, you know, 15, 20 bucks a roll and still be cheaper than them. But why do it? Um, the race to the bottom don't need to. The more we sell, the better prices we're going to be able to get. And, I mean, you know, we have the set margins in every aspect we do. So, I mean, we do other stuff other than... Uh, plans for the future. What's the next step for Venboxel? Uh, the next step for Venboxel, we're always growing. We're trying to get into more roofing products as we speak. I have learned a lot. I've lost a lot of money trying to get into different aspects. So now before we do anything, we make sure we have a stake in the factory. We make sure we go visit it, make sure everything's good. Um, we also are looking to have more shipping hubs throughout the United States just to help us in the back end, help uh, the shipping cost as well. We do have a couple new designs that are coming out, which I'm hoping uh, we're going to be getting patents on and uh, something we never thought we'd be doing, but definitely see a need for it. So we're looking at that going forward as well. And the biggest thing, we're looking at boosting our pallet program for synthetic felt. And that's where we ship you know, one pallet to how many, however many you need, any point, anywhere in the United States. And it opens it up to every single riffer. You know, if you need one pallet, you're only doing 60 rolls of synthetic a year, give us a call. We're happy to ship it to you, take care of you. Or if you're doing 40 pallets a week, we'll take care of you too. So that's the biggest thing is getting our pallet program. I don't feel there's anybody in the United States that really sells these synthetic felt per pallet at a good price. What do you say to roofers? What do you message to roofers who are frustrated with the price increases? What roofers can do like as a community? Because I see so many comments and so many pissed roofers out there who is mad at ABC Supply, who is mad at owing scorning and the rest of the manufacturing community for raising the prices. But in reality, it's a commodity business. They can do it. They do have upper hand. What roofers can do? What's your message to them? What roofers can do to help, help themselves, don't follow the status quo. You're a roofer. You're already not following the status quo. You don't need to go to one of these big guys and give them money so they could go buy another Lamborghini or whatever they're doing with their money. Buy direct. You have options to buy direct from the manufacturers. There's no reason to go to that middle guy. Yeah, you could go in, you could talk to the salesman. I'm sure he's a nice guy, might take you out for dinner or whatnot, but how much is that costing you at the end? Buy direct where you can, save your money. You work hard for your money. Roofing is one of the hardest jobs out there. I mean, if you're out there in a, I'm in Northern Ohio, it's not like Florida. I mean, we still get 90 degree days. Being on a roof like that, it's awful. Every dollar you work for, you work for. So spend it wisely, buy direct. There's ways to buy direct. We can help you buy direct. And That's your message. My name is Dmitry Lipinski and I approve that message. <laughs> Comment below what you guys think. I want to hear from you. Uh, be creative. I read all of my comments. Uh, we, we need to figure this situation out because I feel like it's a big, big bottleneck in the industry right now. On the bottom, we have thousands and thousands of roofing companies. Then we have very few manufacturers and fewer uh, suppliers and suppliers getting bigger because they keep buying everyone. So they have, you know, upper hand on all of us. But what can we do? Comment below and uh, I think we can figure it out. Yeah, definitely we can. <laughs>